Spring 2007. The Gudrun Maersk, one of the largest container ships on Earth, sails 32 kilometers off the Chinese coast. started turning so early, but due to the current, then I could see it afterwards, so it was a good idea. Her deck stacked high with 3,000 shipping containers, a multi-million dollar cargo. And 32 kilometers out at sea, the crew of the Gudrun Maersk is just about to put it all overboard. At one of the biggest cargo facilities on Earth. The Yangshan Deepwater Container Port. It'll be years before this mega port is finished, but Yangshan's docks are already over three kilometers long. On those docks, some of the world's biggest and brawniest cranes. High-tech trucks. One of the most advanced control systems at any container port. And some of the best container port operators in the business are getting ready for the Gudrun Maersk. They'll have a good day's work ahead of them and they'll have less than a day to do it. From the moment this giant ship docks, they'll have just 20 hours to unload her 3,000 shipping containers and load her up with 2,000 more. Then they'll have to move the 3,000 unloaded containers to the mainland, over 32 kilometers of open sea. And there's no room for error. Every ship, every day, Yangshan's battling powerful rivals for supremacy in a billion dollar business. Shanghai, China's biggest city and the world's busiest cargo port. In the 21st century, China's export-import trades exploding by nearly 30% per year. And Shanghai's in the right place at the right time. Located about halfway down the Chinese coast, right at the point where the Yangtze, the world's third largest river, empties into the sea. Billions of dollars of goods made in China travel down the Yangtze to be shipped abroad. In 2001, that was 300 million tons of cargo. By 2005, it was nearly 800 million. Shanghai should be sitting pretty. But it's got problems. Big problems. Problems these two guys deal with every day. Wu Jiang Wen and Jiang Wei are Shanghai harbor pilots. Their job, climb on board cargo ships arriving from the open sea and steer them to a safe berth at Shanghai's docks. And that's even harder than you think. The color of the sea reveals why. Muddy brown, the color of a river. Every year, millions of tons of silt wash down the Yangtze River and into the sea.
Where the Yangtze meets the ocean, all that silt piles up in sandbars. Exactly where hundreds of ships are sailing into Shanghai. At low tide, the silted up entrance to the world's busiest cargo port is only seven meters deep. And in today's world, any ship that can clear seven meters is a mere rowboat. The biggest ships that come into Shanghai need 12 meters water depth. So they are very dependent on high tide. So when we go in or out of port, we have to pay very careful attention to the height of the tide. Today's vessel needs only eight meters depth. It cleared the sandbars at high tide. But that doesn't mean Wu Zhang Wen and Zhang Wei are having a nice day. They look relaxed, but they know their problems are just beginning. Because Shanghai's aquatic arteries are seriously clogged with more than just silt. Their ships now entering the Huangpu, a smaller river that runs through Shanghai. And they're about to steer it through one of the worst maritime traffic jams on Earth. Normally, we'll have more than 100 ships coming into the river mouth and another 100 ships going out over 24 hours. And that's just the big ships over 5,000 tons. I'm not even counting the smaller ones. It is not a simple matter of one ship following another. There are ports all along the river. Ships have to cut across traffic, so there is a lot of risk. Shipping expert Matthew Flynn compares sailing up the Huangpu to commuting to work in the middle of the Indianapolis 500. It's probably one of the most exciting and memorable uh, journeys that any ship captain can make. That doesn't mean that he's looking forward to it. It's probably the most challenging uh, port entrance there is in Asia. And believe it or not, there's more. If you measure the Huangpu River bank to bank, it's 400 meters wide. But our two pilots know they're working with a lot less. The navigable waterway, the waterway that's deep enough, is fewer than 300 meters wide. In some places, it's only a bit more than 200 meters. And that worries Shanghai pilots, because a moving ship needs a distance three to five times its length to turn around. To avoid a collision, a 100-meter-long ship will need 300 to 500 meters. And on the Huangpu, it isn't going to get it. For instance, the ship we're on today is 145 meters long. So when it comes into the river, it can't turn itself around. And ships don't have brakes like cars do. If you slow a ship down to avoid a collision, you can't steer it. It would just drift out of control. So if there is an emergency, there is nothing I can do. That's why everybody's glad when the tugboats finally take over and push the ship into the dock. <laughs> because to these guys, a cruise up the Huangpu is about as relaxing as steering a runaway truck through a crowded shopping mall. Shanghai's navigational challenges make life interesting for Wu Zhanwen and Jiang Wei. But why should they be a big problem for Shanghai? After all, Shanghai's been a world-class port for decades. 
All that time, the Yangtze was choking with silt. And the Huangpu was never much wider. So what's changed? This has. The size of the ships sailing into Shanghai. Gigantic container ships. The most cost-effective way to move enormous quantities of freight around the planet. If they can't get their cargoes in and out of Shanghai, Shanghai can't give the world what it needs. Ships will go elsewhere, and Shanghai will be left behind. After World War II, shipping containers revolutionized the cargo industry. Unlike loose cargo, packed containers could simply be offloaded onto waiting trucks and driven away. The first ships carried only a few dozen containers. It didn't take a shipping genius to realize that the more containers one ship could carry per voyage, the more money ship owners would make. So container ships got bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, if you're making a thousand dollars per container that you're hauling across the ocean, it's a dollar and cents type of equation. The bigger ships you can that you can build, uh, the more cargo that you can carry. In the 1990s, Shanghai built new container ports at Waigao Chao, on the ocean just beyond the mouth of the Yangtze. Ships docking at Waigao Chao didn't have to sail up the Huangpu, and the water there was over 12 meters deep. For a time, things seemed fine, but then the ships got even bigger. As big as the Gudrun Maersk, over 40 meters wide, over 300 meters long, longer than the Eiffel Tower, and needing deeper water than Waigao Chao could offer. Even at 12.5 meters, that's not really deep enough for the biggest ships. We're talking 9,000, 10,000, 13,000 TU container ships. So you really want something that's at least 15 meters. Today's mega ships, like the Gudrun Maersk, are in a class by themselves. A class called Post Panamax, because they're too wide to fit through the Panama Canal. And they're also too big for Shanghai. Steering a 350 meter long vessel up the traffic choked Huangpu isn't the best idea. And the Huangpu's 400 meter wide channel isn't much wider than the Gudrun Maersk is long. Turning would be a nightmare. And in the early 1990s, Shanghai gave the world's biggest ships something else to worry about. Two suspension bridges spanning the Huangpu. If a big ship came in, it could not pass under the Huangpu Bridge. Only ships of 48 meters tall or under can pass under that bridge. In the 21st century, 30% of the world's shipping containers were traveling on post-Panamax vessels. 